Good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us. I know we may have a couple of latecomers still joining, but we do want to make sure that we stay on time as there's a lot of information to cover today. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Amanda Cito. I am the Strategic Volunteer Engagement Director for Trident United Way, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. We have some great guest speakers uh, to talk about tenant rights and resources. And with that, we will go ahead and kick this off. So as you may have seen when you registered, so this is session four of our Ask the Expert webinar series, and it is all about renting, know your tenant rights and resources. And so we have two guest speakers today, Nicole Paluzzi, who is a housing attorney with Charleston Pro Bono Legal Services, and Lori Carpenter, who is the Chief Strategy and Development Officer with SC Thrive, but also has a vast knowledge of housing in our area. So just a few housekeeping items for uh, use, utilizing the webinar platform today. Uh, because we have such great information and a lot of information that our speakers will be sharing with you, um, we ask you to try avoid multitasking. If you are working from home or um, you know just used to listening and multitasking, we know it's very tempting to do, but we wanna make sure that you get the most out of this webinar. Um, so please pay attention uh, to the slides too that we'll be sharing as um, you'll receive a lot of information and may even want to take some notes as we go along. There is a question box in your webinar menu. We ask you to utilize that menu to submit questions to either speaker or to all of us, and we'll be sure to answer as many questions as we can. Um, well, there will be a Q&A session at the end after both of our speakers have presented their information uh, where we'll be addressing questions to the larger group, but our presenters will also try and answer any um, specific situational questions you may have. So just very briefly, if you are new to Trident United Way, uh, we just wanted to give you a quick overview as to who we are and what we do. So we are a community nonprofit organization ourselves, and our vision is to be the leader in uniting our community to improve lives. Uh, and to do so, we feel it's important to focus on not just one area, uh, but three areas. So we look at education, preparing children for future success, health, creating a healthier tri-county, and financial stability, which is helping people work and be financially stable. Uh, we most certainly feel that this topic today falls in line with uh, financial stability as we want to ensure that everyone in our community has access to safe and secure housing. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. So we will first start with looking at uh, an overview of the eviction process. And then Lori from SC Thrive will talk about COVID-19 rental assistance program. And then again, we'll have our question and answer session at the end. So with that, uh, Nicole Paluzzi is here to join us. And as I mentioned, she is a housing attorney with Charleston Pro Bono Legal Services. So Nicole, I am going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. All right, my name is Nicole Paluzzi. You may have seen me involved with Housing Court or with Eviction Defense in the past or one of these other training programs. So today our discussion is going to be focused on the practicality of the eviction process. So the actual part where it's going through court. So we're gonna cover what you need to know about evictions, but I have to give you a legal disclaimer for starters. And Am I sharing my screen? Okay, so this home, this program is created as a part of an educational lecture series, and I do not claim to be an expert in the practice of housing law. Housing law is not a field of recognized specialty within the practice of law. Today's presentation is designed to give information about how the summary courts usually conduct eviction hearings. 
There are going to be differences between judges and jurisdictions, so this will be focused on the common format and some common courtroom etiquette that can help you prepare yourself in the event you need to appear in an eviction hearing. I strongly encourage everyone with a tenancy issue to speak to legal counsel, and if you are a low-income resident of Charleston County, you may apply for legal services with our office by visiting our website, www.charlestonprobono.org, and filling out the application. That being said, let's go on to the next one. The eviction process is specified by the state code of laws. It gives the grounds that your landlord can file an eviction for and when they may file. So it's not just the grounds, but how long must pass before they may bring that action. Then what to do if you are served with an eviction action, what that looks like and what the next steps you need to take will be and how you can prepare yourself for court. I've also included some special considerations that are applicable to the COVID-19 situation. There are differences with how we are conducting court and what you need to do to prepare for it. So we'll address those at the end. But going into the grounds, there are three grounds, only three grounds. Non-payment of rent being the first one, the end of lease term or a no fault situation where maybe you had a one year lease and the landlord didn't renew or you didn't give notice of intent to renew and your lease has come to its natural end or there has been some sort of breach of lease agreement now on the paperwork that you'll receive it needs to have that box checked and it also needs to tell you what the breach is and there are times where the breach of lease agreement may state failure to pay rent if you have been late more than once, then you have a habitual late rent payment. So two or more times, that's habitual within the lease term. And so you can be evicted for non-payment of rent ground one, as well as non-payment of rent ground three, if it is habitual, but it needs to be stated. And they'll have to give you enough information about that ground for you to be able to prepare your defense. So when can your landlord file that eviction action? Everything in landlord tenant law is based on a contract theory of notice and meaningful opportunity to cure that breach. So non-payment of rent can be something that is written notice into your lease agreement. It will say a quote from section 710 of the landlord tenant act that says if if you do not pay your rent on time, this is your notice. You will get no other notice so long as you are a tenant here. If you have not paid your rent and five days have passed, on that sixth day, the landlord may bring a lawful action for eviction. And that notice is contained within your lease agreement. For things like uh, failure to make repairs when due or demanded unauthorized pet, those notices need to be sent subsequently. So those are a 14 day notice. For rent, it's five days. So you may have rent due on the first, late after the fifth. That grace period of five days is written into the act. And even if your contract says the rent's due on the first, it's late after the third, your landlord cannot hold you to an obligation that is narrower than the landlord tenant act. So look for your five day provision, read your lease agreement, and make sure you've got that notice appropriately stated in a conspicuous area. So again, the 14 day notice as it applies for breaches of lease, if I perhaps had a dog or a cat and I wasn't authorized to have one, before my landlord may bring an action against me for possession, they need to deliver to me some written notice, whether it's email, text, or otherwise as specified between our relationship as landlord and tenant, letting me know that I'm in breach of the lease, what I've done wrong and give me the opportunity to cure that before they can file an action. Now, some properties and tenancies are protected specially under the CARES Act. If you are in a federally backed mortgage dwelling or if you are a subsidized tenant, whether you're getting Section 8, project-based housing assistance, low-income housing tax credit, hud -Bash, whatever your subsidy is, you are most likely subject to the Violence Against Women's Act statute. If you are in one of those properties that is a covered dwelling, as specified by the CARES Act, then you cannot be brought in action against for the non-payment of rent 
only at this time. And you're entitled to a 30 day notice when the window goes up. So a month from today, around, November, um, around July 24th, the sun set on the current iteration of the CARES Act closes. And you are entitled to receive a 30 day notice for demand for rent before your landlord may proceed. Everyone else, you only get five days and it may have been written into your lease. All right, let's go to the next slide. How do I know if my landlord has filed? This is actually something that comes up regularly in cases that I have where a tenant is unaware whether or not what they've been given is a filing for eviction or some other form of notice. I have a lot of people that'll come to me with a non-renewal notice and believe that the landlord has filed an eviction because it tells them when they need to be out. The picture that you're seeing off to the side here where it says state of South Carolina County of and it's all left open, that is what a rule to vacate or show cause filing looks like. This one's unfilled out. You may also receive something that looks substantially similar to this and it says application for ejectment and it will come with a summons depending on what county you're in. But Charleston County uses these and it specifies those three grounds. So where you see those check boxes in the upper third, you have failed to pay rent when due or demanded and they have to give you an amount, terms of tenancy or lease or occupancy have ended, or you've violated the terms or conditions of your lease by. Those are those three grounds. And as you can see, there is a bold statement in the middle. Failure to vacate the premises or respond within 10 days may result in the issuance of a writ of ejectment. I want to call your attention to this because this is called a show cause hearing. The party who's filed the paperwork has initiated a proceeding against you. And if you fail to challenge it, then no cause need be shown. And by default, a writ of ejectment may be issued against you. There are counties that will let you know when your hearing is, but the majority of counties in South Carolina will require you, the tenant, or the defendant in this case, to set up that hearing. You have to request it, you have to schedule it, you need to show up for it. The service of process, you may be familiar with somebody coming around and saying you've been served with legal papers. It won't always look like that in landlord-tenant litigation. You may find something has been taped to your door. It's called posting. Posting is permissible under the rules for the service of an ejectment action. So do pay attention to this. Even if it doesn't look like what you've seen on TV, any paperwork you receive from a court or from your landlord is important information that you need to have and you need to preserve so that you can bring it to your advocate, to any service providers you may be seeking assistance from, and to the court. So all of that is very important and you should retain a copy for your records. If you have received a letter from your landlord that is demanding compliance with rent payments or a term of your lease, not the duration of the lease, but a term within the lease, like a paragraph, you are likely receiving that pre-filing notice that we talked about in the earlier slide where you have to get a certain amount of time to cure. So you've received your notice to cure and now landlord has filed a new action alleging that you have failed to cure. So this is what you want to look for. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, opportunity to cure. For end of lease term, your lease agreement should specify how much notice you need to give. If you have a National Apartment Association boilerplate lease, it usually specifies 60 days. 30 days is typical, and it is what the South Carolina Residential Landlord Tenant Act states is the appropriate notice time for a month-to-month -month tenancy. So if your initial lease term was one year and your lease is silent about how much notice you need to give to renew or to end the lease, it will most likely be considered 30 days. If you are a roomer, which means you live in the same dwelling with other people, you have common areas, you're on separate leases, the landlord may actually be a part of that tenancy, you may be considered a week to week tenant and you only get seven days of notice. So it is very important to know how much notice you get and how much you must give. 
with that breach of lease, as we discussed in section 710, you get 14 days notice of breach and opportunity to correct before landlord may file. Now we talked about the five day notice you get for rent and your landlord cannot reduce that to four or fewer days by lease agreement. Same for section 710. If your landlord gives you a notice that says you have 10 days to correct this and it is not something that could be immediately filed upon like a criminal action, you're running an unlawful tattoo parlor in your home. Um, but if it is something that is just a breach of lease, civil and non, non criminal, they have to give you those full 14 days. You cannot reduce that any further. So the lease agreement specifying that quote I gave you, if you do not pay your rent on time, it's always a good idea to revisit your lease agreement and see if that particular language is included in your lease agreement, because if it is there, then your landlord does not need to give you separate written notice. And additionally, underscore this one, if it's not in your lease and you have already received a rent demand, a five-day rent demand one time during your lease, they do not need to give you a second written rent demand for another rental period being late. So if you're late in February and you get a written notice and then you're late in April, your landlord does not need to give you a second written notice if they can prove they gave you that one back in February. All right. Okay, so you've been served. Now what do you do? It is imperative that you seek assistance. I recommend everyone go to 211 to get connected, whether you're dialing 211 from your mobile phone or going to sc211.org on the website. Whatever you're needing to do to get a hold of them, get connected with the service provider network in your area, especially if this is not something you've ever had to deal with before. You may not know what all's out there, and this is the best place to go to get that centralized information. I need you to get organized. You need you to get organized, and the service providers you get connected with will need you to get organized as well. And that is usually going to include a copy of your complete lease with all addendums, modifications, and rule changes, a ledger of all of the payments you've made as a tenant, whether that's your receipts, canceled checks, bank statements, a printout from your tenant portal, whatever you have to prove compliance with the rental amount, and any information that you may have that would evidence a counterclaim. And by counterclaim, I mean, I tenant gave my landlord a 14 day demand to repair plumbing in our kitchen. Here's when I gave it to him. Here's how I gave it to him. I sent it certified mail. Here's the certified mail receipt. And also here are the pictures of the non-functioning plumbing in my kitchen. You will need to provide that to your attorney. You will need to provide that to any advocate working on your behalf, and you will need to provide it to your resource provider. It's also a very good idea, if you have the ability to do this, to get the mailing information for your landlord. So whether it's a property management firm or the actually actual owner of the dwelling you're leasing, if you can provide them a good method of communication with the landlord, it makes the whole process go smoother. Now, one of the other things I wanna call your attention to is this image here, which is the South Carolina Judicial Branch's homepage. If you look over where this arrow is pointing, it says records search. That is where you may go. So it's the SC courts, S-C-O-U-R-T-S dot org judicial page, click on the record search and follow the prompts until you get to a search field where you can enter your information and find out whether or not you have a pending action against you. We regularly do have tenants come to us believing that an eviction has been filed against them. We even sometimes have had landlords who have used the actual court papers and filled them out themselves and handed them to the tenant. But what fails is in searching for that record, the, the filing has not actually occurred. And it's very important to know what your timeline is. It's very important to know what your case number is. And it's important to know where you're assigned court. So do check that. Um, if you go to an attorney or um, a housing counselor, how to prove housing counselor, they can check that for you or assist you. Um, but it's important to know what, out, what is pending against you. And that's not just landlord tenant, it might be a speeding ticket. And then the last thing you need to do is once you've got all of that organized, demand your hearing. 
you only get 10 days of the day of service to demand that hearing. So all of these things you've been assigned to do here in order to best produce your case has to be done very quickly. And if you have a job and children, that can make it seem even more difficult. Um, but it is important that you do those four things. Check for the case, demand your hearing, get in touch with the service provider network and find out what's out there and try and get an attorney. Preparing for court. Meet with your attorney in advance of the hearing. Please, as an attorney, I'm saying, please do not come to me the day before your hearing and beg for assistance. We want to help you, but we can't do so in a competent way if we haven't met you until the second we're walking into the hearing. What we need to do is be able to prepare your case. The court will appreciate us having a copy of any evidence that we're pretend or intending to offer as an exhibit. So that includes leases, written notices, receipts, any sort of witnesses that we may need to call. So if your brother-in-law has personal knowledge of um, compliance with an allegation of lease violations, such as you haven't been cutting the grass and your brother-in-law is going to come say that his lawn service comes and cuts it every Saturday, he needs to be prepared to be present and offer that actual testimony to the court allow the court to ask questions and also to let the landlord have the opportunity to cross-examine. So in a civil matter such as this, you have to produce your evidence, you're responsible for your case. And you wanna make sure that everyone that would be able to give personal evidence such as sight, sound, their own personal knowledge information is prepared to be there. If you are offering in a rent, failure to pay rent case, if you are offering to the court that you have offered your landlord third party assistance to provide funding and cure the breach of lease, especially in cases where the landlord has given you a five day rent demand and you have timely given them proof that SC Thrive or another um, service provider has given you a letter saying you're approved for a certain amount, but what we need is a landlord package and your landlord is not willing to work with you. It's not a guaranteed defense, but there are a lot of courts that will entertain that as a refusal to receive tendered rent. So if the court sees that you have documentation that a legitimate entity has offered a certain amount of money to be paid on your account, on your behalf, related to the extraordinary circumstances we find ourselves in, it will be helpful to you to raise that to the court and show, I can pay my rent going forward, I had an arrearage based on coronavirus and closures. I offered this to my landlord in a timely manner and with you know, the assistance of counsel, but landlord refused to accept it. The court may find in your favor or ask the, the landlord to allow some sort of um, settlement of disputed claim with their consent. So that's important to have. Um, and additionally, if you have any other information from a third party assistance provider, we recently had a person who came forward and said that um, a, a veterans group was paying all of their rent and then the landlord just started returning it. So it was returned money. Um, be dressed appropriately, be on time and be on your best behavior. Please. You will not endear yourself to the court if your cell phone is in your purse and it is going off and you are wearing something that's borderline see-through or really, really casual. Um, you wanna make sure that anytime the court has called attention to whose turn it is to speak, you follow that. Um, one of the things that's polite to do as a court formality is in your first addressing the judge is to stand up and say, may I please the court? If you have an attorney, they will handle that for you. Um, but just make sure that if there's anything you want to say and you're represented by counsel, you confer quietly with your counsel or write it down on their legal pad before you advance that to the court. You want to make sure that you're not hindering your case when you think you're helping it. And the most important thing is to bring all of your evidence and be able to provide it to the court and the opposing party. There is nothing more difficult than when you're trying to figure out how to reproduce evidence on the site of the hearing. So you wanna make sure if you at all possibly can, screenshot those text messages with your landlord, put them in a Word document, print them out. Um, same for everything else. All right. 
and then the special considerations for COVID-19. Notice may be mailed certified return receipt requested and you actually didn't sign it. This is the biggest one I'm dealing with right now. Uh, the postal office is allowing postal workers to sign COVID-19 on certified mail restricted delivery and return receipt requested. They are certifying that they've delivered it as addressed to the address with, on the envelope, but you yourself being the recipient or the person you're intending to send it to may not actually be the person who has signed for it. Um, it's less problematic in landlord tenants. We're seeing it more problematic in family law cases, um, but it's something to be aware of. Again, posting of notice is allowed within certain circumstances. So if you are checking your record under the public index through that South Carolina Judicial website, you may see service and an archived summons, or you may see service parentheses posted. Now what that means is they didn't actually hand the document, the constable did not actually hand the document into someone's hands, it was taped to the door, there will be two separate postings and then a mailing, and that is still considered good service so long as they are following the appropriate statute. You may, as a litigant, inquire about virtual appearance for your hearing, for yourself, and for your witnesses. There is a operating order right now, South Carolina Supreme Court has ordered, for the allowance of remote and telephonic hearings. The courts in Charleston County are largely implementing this, um, but you do need to check with each magistrate to make sure that they have the ability to log into a similar setting to what we're using right now. We're using WebEx, we're using Zoom, we're also using teleconferencing depending on what's available. If you have an attorney, they may be able to help facilitate that. So have an attorney or a housing professional confirm whether or not your property is covered under the CARES Act, at least for the rest of the month that we have uh, pending with CARES Act properties. You wanna make sure that if something is filed against you, that you are not just accepting the landlord certification as proof of any compliance. Um, we've already found several that have been erroneously filled out and filed. There was a lot of problems in Greenville to get started and other states are seeing bulk filings being made with um, inappropriate properties. And lastly, to be prepared to provide your own personal protective equipment if you are appearing in person. Pretty much every court is requiring you to wear a mask now. Um, we additionally in this area have a mask ordinance going into effect on the 1st. You do not want to be in court and told that you can't come in because they don't have a mask for you and have to get a continuance, especially if you've asked other people to show up on your behalf and testify and maybe they had to take off work. So just be prepared, whether it's a scarf, gloves, hand sanitizer, whatever it is you wanna to have to make yourself feel comfortable. It's your day in court. You need to take responsibility for yourself and we will help in any way, shape or form. All right. And if you are in a subsidized tenancy or you are leasing a property that has a federally backed mortgage, you may have additional protections under CARES. If you have to do an annual certification or if when you moved into the property, you had to prove that you weren't over a certain AMI, area median income, that's probably a subsidized property, whether it's LIHTC or a, um, HUD program. Uh, there are also USDA coverages. It depends on where you are. Check with an attorney. Uh, ProPublica, uh, the Charleston Post and Courier newspaper, a lot of news organizations have a means of searching by your address or checking the register of utilities. Um, these are some good databases that you can use to search for your CARES applicability. Um, and if you still have a question, do reach out to an attorney. There are legal service providers throughout the entire state. I think that's all for me. If anybody's got any specific questions. Thank you so much, Nicole. This was a, a lot of great information. If anyone has specific questions for Nicole, please feel free to utilize our question box and submit them. And we will, um, again, do our best to uh, get them answered either during the Q&A session or if it's uh, more specific to your situation, Nicole may be able to respond in the chat box specifically to you. So we will continue on and I 
would love to introduce to you now Lori Carpenter with SC Thrive. And I apologize, I failed to mention she has a colleague joining her today, Katrina Seastrunk. Katrina is based here locally uh, in the Tri-County area for SC Thrive and works very closely with Lori. So Lori, I will turn it over to you now. All right, thank you um, so much, Amanda. Um, we are um, blessed and honored to actually continue serving the state of South Carolina. And we're in partnership with um, South Carolina Housing to provide the COVID-19 rental assistance program. And Nicole, I know that a couple of items that I'm gonna say, basically get organized and get all of your documents together that's going to be a repeat um, with this program as well. The important thing that we need to realize with this COVID-19 rental assistance program, and I'm actually going to read it per word, so I'm going to look down for a minute. It's going to say, this program, just so that you know, we're going to provide emergency housing assistance to renters that are affected by the following. Shutdowns, closures, layoffs, reduced work hours or unpaid leave due to the COVID-19 health um, crisis. Just so that you know, any eligible household is gonna receive the assistance of $1,500 for rent and the payments are made directly to the landlord. So the wonderful thing about this is for the whole program, there will be a direct connection with the landlords to make sure that the payments are made directly, number one, but number two, that we will have a true record that the um, tenants and those households are brought to be current um, with the landlords. Just so that you know, this program is a one-time lump sum payment. So if you've already applied and you've already received the assistance, you're no longer eligible. However, if you've applied and you were denied for some reason or another, you are eligible to reapply because circumstances and with the evolving um, crisis, things are always changing. So if you were not eligible in May or say last week, you could be eligible moving forward. And we encourage everyone to reapply because we know that circumstances are constantly evolving with COVID-19. If you wanna, next slide. Um, we're going to, I'm just going to dive in just to make it easy and I'm going to go over the program eligibility and I'll also give some, um, with this program, we listen to the public, we listen to our partners um, and realize that there are barriers and so SC Thrive, we are trying all the time to remove the barriers. The first thing that is eligible is that you must be a South Carolina resident. To be a South Carolina resident, the easiest um, documentation that you can have is a driver's license or a South Carolina identification card. But during these times of COVID, we know that the DMV is closed or they have reduced hours. So what we have done is if you do not have your photo ID, we in turn are taking two forms of um, utility bills. So it could be your electric bill, or it could be your phone bill or cable bill, but it has to be the name of the applicant and the address that you're in. So we're using those two forms or a governmental ID as proof of residency for South Carolina. Another item, which I know that um, Amanda is gonna put in the chat box for you, is that applicants have to have a household income at the time of application. You must be 80% or below of your area median income. It changes. So the median income in, the, in Charleston County could be different from the median income in Horry County. So there is, um, and thank you, Amanda, you'll see in the chat box, she has attached the link. So depending upon the county that you live in, 
um, you have to be 80% or below. That link already has the top end of 80%, just so that you're aware of it. One thing that we are taking into consideration because we know that during these times of COVID, your, um, your income is up and down, up and down, depending upon what is happening and what industry you're in. You have to be 80% or below at the time of application. So we are only taking the snapshot. So if you applied on June 10th, we will look at the pay stubs that are up to June 10th. So at that time, you just have to be 80% or below. The one good thing is because of this program being COVID-19, applicants' income that are impacted, we're going as far back as March 2020. Um, I find it interesting since COVID-19, the 19 signifies 2019, if anyone is curious on that. However, um, in South Carolina and for this program, their start date for COVID-19 is March 10th. So we are looking at income that has been impacted March 10th going forward. Um, one thing, if you have applied, do not be surprised if we ask what was your income in February, just so that we ask that because we want to make sure that we can tell a true story. The further that we get into that, it's less likely that we'll be asking for February, but I want everyone, um, if you get an email and we ask what your income was in February, is because if you were impacted in the month of March, we have to show a paper trail that you were impacted. Um, so just be aware of that. The rental um, assistance payment must be brought current for all of those eligible households. I know that you love to hear this because we just want to make sure that you're, um, once we give you the assistance, that your um, balance goes to zero. Here is a wonderful thing that we've been working with, and this has been since day one. For example, say that your rent and your past due balance is only $900. This is a payment of $1,500. Yes, you will have a credit of $600 with your landlord moving forward. Another thing, let's the negative side of it, if your past due balance is $2,000 and we can only do a payment of $1,500, we have community organizations all over the state, and I know that Trident United Way is very familiar with it. We will make a payment of 1500, but we will work with another organization. So if they pledge the $500, we will use that and make the payment directly to the landlord. We have also, which is wonderful, landlords and rental agencies across the state are actually willing to forgive. So if you have a balance of this $2,000 and we're willing to pay $1,500, Katrina has been helping me um, statewide, not just um, low country. I see her nodding her head because we have landlords all across the state that are willing to forgive this amount. Um, it is wonderful how everyone is coming together to ensure that everyone has shelter. The two negative things, I hate saying the word negative, but that will enable the person not to be able to um, apply for this program is if the applicant is currently on any subsidized rental assistance program, which Nicole was mentioning um, through the CARES Act. If they are um, getting any assistance and are on a permanent subsidized rental assistance, you do not um, qualify for this program. Um, also, the federal government has a federal pandemic unemployment compensation program. That means that if you're on unemployment and you're getting an additional $600 um, a week for that benefit, you do not, um, uh, you are not eligible for this program. However, you know, there's always a but. Like Nicole mentioned, landlords always say yes, but. Um, the wonderful thing is I was able to get it approved. If the applicant is pending or it is unknown, 
and when we get the due um, application, it will say in the on the right hand side of it is that for the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, it states that it is pending. We are taking that and you are eligible to go forward because no official ruling has been made. You are not receiving and you are not approved. So with that, um, that is the big caveat and we like individuals to know that um, we are taking that as a no when it is a pending and we're moving forward because we're trying to help as many individuals as possible. Okay, next, um, for the required documentation, I went over um, a little bit of this, but the South Carolina resident photo identification, that is a requirement because we need to prove that you're a South Carolina resident. Again, I would like you to state that if you do not have the updated, the number one thing that we're getting is individuals have a South Carolina identification card or a driver's license, but it does not match the active lease. Do not worry, just send us a utility bill with that and we will match it up and we will keep moving forward on it. Um, another thing is we have to have an active rent or lease agreement because it needs to be that you are actively living there. Um, one thing that Nicole mentioned um, earlier is that say that the lease agreement was um, expired April 1. However, if there is that statement in there under the rental agreement, it states that if this is expired, it automatically transfers over to a month to month lease. We look for that verbiage because if that verbiage is in there, it is still considered an active rental lease agreement because it is expired for the one year. Now it reverted to a month to month lease agreement. We accept that. For active lease agreements, sometimes the active lease agreements are expired, truly expired. They do not have that um, paragraph in there that it reverts back to a month to month. We are taking statements from the landlord it has to be written on their letterhead and signed by the landlord that they are aware that this lease agreement has expired however they've been month to month we have numerous lease agreements where they expired actually back in 2017 but then they've just been converted to month to month they have stayed there we are taking the landlord's affidavit their statement with the lease agreement and tying it all in as an active lease. Um, just so that you know, I did already um, mention this, the address on the ID and the address on the rental agreement must match. We already um, mentioned about the utility bill of how important it is. One caveat on this is that the utility bill has to be in the name of the person that is applying for this program. We cannot accept that we have um, John Smith on the cable bill and has the address. You cannot submit that. The name on the utility bill must match the person who is applying for the program. Just because we are trying to prove the residency for that individual landlord affidavit and i think um amanda do you have that form to um, put up there or later the landlord affidavit is required um, it is available online but we need a landlord affidavit and a w-9 from the individuals because we are paying the landlord directly and with us paying the landlord directly, it is income for the landlord. So the landlord affidavit is there, they are affirming that you owe $750, that that is what your past due. The W-9 is because it's income at the end of the year, we will be sending them tax forms. Isn't that wonderful <laughs> on that? And then also more importantly, like we said, we have to prove a decrease of income due to the pandemic. 
for individuals um, that are on a fixed income, if they have part-time jobs and they have lost hours on the part-time job, they would qualify for this program. However, if the only income that they have is their social security and they are on a fixed income, there has been no decrease in income. So we would not be able to approve them because they are not eligible for the program. And I think that was it. There's the forms, just so that you know. Individuals, we can apply online through um, scthrive.org or for individuals, because we know a lot of the individuals do not have really good internet service. And in these trying times, we understand that completely. So with um, the rental assistance and the landlord affidavit, you can get all of these documents on our website. You can print them off. You can submit them through our email, which is COVID-19 rental assistance at scthrive.org, or we have a secure fax line because this is sensitive information. The secure fax number is um, the secure fax number is 833-520-4000. And um, Katrina, if you don't mind in the chat, um, if you can put the correct email. We forgot the COVID-19 for the um, email address. I wanna make sure everyone has the right one and for the, and for the secure facts. Um, and that is basically it. The turnaround I would like to mention, um, how to apply is, you know, more importantly, like Nicole said, we need all the supporting documents. So you need to make sure that you have your lease agreement. You also have the application. We need a signature. We're finding out that individuals are just faxing this information, but we need the true application with your signature so that we can begin the review process. We also need your pay stubs or income um, on it and then the landlord affidavit, and then your utility bills or your driver's license, whichever you prefer. You can apply online and click and start the application, or you can do it by email or for the secure fax, um, how I mentioned earlier. And there is, um, there is our 800 number where you can ask questions. And that is my personal email. Thank you, Lori, so much. We are uh, getting all of the correct information here. Uh, the uh, email address and secure fax line that you mentioned into the chat box. Um, so folks can copy that. Um, or also visit your website, the SC Thrive website, should they have um, additional questions or wanna access those forms um, and links. So at this time, we will open it up for questions from anyone uh, for either Nicole or for Lori and Katrina. And as a bonus, we ha also have Katie Reams who works for uh, the uh, United Way Association of South Carolina as a 211 resource specialist. So 211 was mentioned a few times as another option um, for uh, rental assistance. Uh, 211 uh, is a full database of our state of different nonprofit organizations and the resources and services that they offer. Um, and as Lori mentioned, Katrina and the rest of the team at SC Thrive are working very closely with 211 to help folks um, maybe supplement what SC Thrive is able to provide, um, as well as other uh, resources when it comes to utility payments or um, just looking for food sources. So uh, Katie, not to put you on the spot, but you can probably do a much better job of explaining what folks can, uh, can get on to 211. Sure. Uh, the 
a couple of good ways to access 211 is uh, the first way is you can dial 211 from any phone um, and it connects via the cell phone uh, tower that it picks up. So it's going to always connect you as long as you're calling within South Carolina to SD211. Um, so even if you're calling from another zip code, um, it will still connect you with SD211. You'll get an operator 24-7, um, 365 days a year. There's also multiple um, languages offered, including Spanish, um, and you'll get an operator that can connect you um, with the information and the referrals um, to fill your needs. So whether that is you're looking for financial assistance, you're looking for food, uh, you're looking for open health clinics, things like that. Um, we can also do some additional next step things past basic needs. So if you're looking for job trainings, if you're looking for a benefit screening, um, if you're looking for help with counseling, things like that, um, we are able to get you in um, get the information to you for those agencies, their phone numbers, their eligibility requirements, their intake process, things like that. You can also access the website at sc211.org at any time um, and look through that exact same database. Um, and then you can download the app, which is just SC211, and it's free on any app store, and it has a nice uh, distance way of searching things so that you can know whether things are one mile away from you, zero miles away, et cetera. Um, if transportation is a barrier there. Excellent, thank you, Katie. A question for Nicole is, are there best practices for um, understanding or requesting your landlord to, um, to have items fixed or replaced in the property that you are renting or, or where does the, um, the the bar kind of lay what the uh, renter is responsible for versus uh, the landlord okay so there are a couple of things there um the landlord tenant act and your lease agreement are going to be the first places to go to identify what responsibilities you have generally speaking tenant responsibilities are going to be day-to-day -day upkeep, taking out your rubbish, making sure there is clear walkways of your own personal effects. Um, and if there is something that is broken and needs repair, you have to let the landlord know. Your right to recover anything against your landlord for their breaching does not come into fruition until you've given them true notice. So if your kitchen sink is leaking and you don't tell them by giving them a written notice and it's very important that it be in writing so you can prove it later not a phone call so email text message mail mail um, let them know specifically what's wrong there's a leak in my kitchen sink around the base of the faucet um, and then give them the opportunity to come and fix that item those are the things you need to do best practices wise that's what's going to be laid out in the landlord tenant act section 710 um, so first you give them the notice. You're noticing the landlord of a material breach of lease like that is your consent to let the landlord come and repair it. Now that doesn't mean they can come at 10 p.m. on Sunday. Um, that means that they can come between eight and eight at your request um, with that written notice. Um, they, can, they have to knock and announce to say they're there and that they're there to either inspect the damage to make sure that they can bring back an appropriate plumber or whomever they need to bring back or get the measurements they need to go buy parts at Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever, um, or that they're actually there to fix it. If they knock and announce that they're there to change out your air filters when this is not otherwise scheduled, that's not the same as uh, the consent to enter and fix the issue you notice them of. So it is not the tenant's responsibility to do plumbing repairs. In fact, don't do plumbing repairs, even if you are a plumber. Um, there are certain things within the act that a tenant cannot contract to do. Um, if you need a permit for it, you cannot contract to do that. That is not appropriate. So just, you know, if you need a permit, that's not your, that's not your arena. You let your landlord know. Um, if you are renting a single family dwelling, though, if you've got a house with a yard, you may contract with your landlord to do certain things like maintain the yard, trim the bushes. Um, I don't, you may make an arrangement with your landlord to say, I will do the fence maintenance or every year the fence needs to be restained, but it needs to be written. You have to have it in writing, specifying exactly what's being done for what consideration. 
Otherwise, that's not going to meet the obligations of the Landlord Tenant Act. And you want to make sure that your lease specifies all of these obligations so you know on the front end what you're getting into. Now, for things like essential services, that's plumbing in, plumbing out, heat, um, things to be able to cook with. So if you're, if you're one method of taking a hot shower is you've got one bathroom, it's got one water heater, and that is not working, that is an essential service repair request. So there are going to be slightly different rules there and slightly different counterclaims if your landlord brings an action against you for possession and you want to demonstrate to the court that they've failed to meet their obligations of upkeep on the premises as to an essential service, because those two things will be different than just a regular, like there's a weather stripping issue that needs to be fixed. If that's the case, Go see an attorney because that is an affirmative claim you can make on your own. You want to go ahead and make sure you're doing it correctly, but you do want to give your landlord a reasonable opportunity to make a repair. You're not just looking for grounds to terminate a lease agreement and bring an action against them. This is your home and you want to fulfill your obligations by letting the landlord know what's wrong. Um, HVAC is not an essential service unless it's for heating purposes. If you've got a heat pump and you're cold, um, but if you're too hot, that's not part of the essential services. Your landlord does have an obligation to maintain any appliances that were there when you moved in. So if you had uh, a central unit and now it's an overabundance of heat, you can do a 14 day letter demanding repair on that HVAC unit. But you need to understand that the act actually states that if the landlord begins in good faith and is pursuing the repair of your HVAC unit or other 14 day notice item, Things like delays in the chain of supply will prevent you from being able to terminate that lease so long as it's still safe to occupy. So if we have a hurricane in September, which we probably will, and there is a major set of issues that takes place, you give your landlord their 14-day notice, they are inspecting, they are keeping in coordination with you as to what the um, intended timeline for repair is. The court is unlikely to grant you termination of that lease under those circumstances, so long as the landlord can show that they're acting in a reasonable and workmanlike manner. If, however, it does become unsafe, you know, it's 110 degrees inside the home, it's a danger, um, you may be able to still bring an action to terminate lease and relocate based on the lack of safety, even though the landlord is doing what they need to do. So there was a couple of things at issue there. You got to give the notice. You got to follow the lease and the act. And you need to know the difference between what's essential and what is just regular maintenance and repair. Um, always a good idea to have an attorney help you walk through these issues. Advice and counsel for your specific issue will be less than an hour in length, most likely. Thank you, Nicole. You know, there's always a lot of questions um, around contracts and leases and whatnot. So thank you for, for helping us uh, parse through some of that. Uh, we are quickly coming up on the end of our time. So again, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we do have our next Ask the Expert webinar session number five scheduled for Thursday, July 9th, so after the holiday. And we will have a utility partner panel discussion. So we'll have a handful of representatives from both um, water and power companies in the Tri-County area. And they will be talking about how they are assisting customers either through relief programs, payment assistant programs, or just otherwise and how they are helping uh, the community and their customers. So please feel free to register on our website for that session coming up. We'd love to have you all. And then lastly, I just want to thank all of our presenters, Nicole, Lori, Katrina, and Katie, as well as all of you for attending. Um, as soon as I close the webinar, we'll ask you to complete a quick five question survey about the session today. Your feedback greatly helps us for each session we host in the future. And then lastly, we have recorded today's session and can make that link available to you uh, if you have any colleagues or family members or friends who uh, you believe uh, would benefit from having this information. So again, thank you all for joining us today and we hope that you enjoyed the session. So take care everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>